Bangladesh 50 years ago. We were on the cusp of something big, something we had never done before. We were about to wipe smallpox off the planet. It's one of humanity's greatest triumphs, one public health has yet to repeat. I'm Dr. Celine Gounder. I'm a physician and epidemiologist. This season of Epidemic, we're going to India and Bangladesh, where smallpox made its last stand to understand how health workers beat the virus. The question I'm asking, how can we dream big in public health again? From KFF Health News and Just Human Productions, Epidemic, Eradicating Smallpox. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. I'm Dr. Celine Gounder. I'm editor-at-large for public health at KFF Health News, and I'm the host of the Epidemic Podcast. In today's conversation, we're going to talk about lessons to be learned from the eradication of smallpox and how those can be applied to public health challenges today. The eradication of smallpox is one of humanity's greatest triumphs. Many doctors and scientists thought it was impossible to eliminate a disease that had lasted for millennia and killed nearly one in three people infected. Smallpox remains the first and only human disease to be wiped out globally. Uh, I'd like to move forward with um, introducing our panelists today. Uh, Dr. Bill Fagey is an epidemiologist and physician and was leader, a leader in the campaign to end smallpox during the 1970s. Fagey is featured in episode two of the Eradicating Smallpox docuseries. And he's also featured in the Nine Lessons series produced by the Becoming Better Ancestors Project. The Nine Lessons, available at ninelessons.org, is a virtual learning series about how the lessons from smallpox eradication could be applied to COVID and other public health and societal challenges. Also joining us today is Dr. Helene Gale, who's also an epidemiologist and physician. She's the president of Spelman College. She's also a board member of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and past director of the foundation's program on HIV, tuberculosis, and reproductive health. She spent two decades with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, focusing primarily on HIV AIDS prevention and global health. Uh, so welcome and thank you for joining us today, Bill and Helene. Um, I'd like to start with um, talking about some of the challenges we face in science communication. And as we've seen during the COVID pandemic, one of the big challenges uh, is balancing reassurance with uncertainty. And before I ask you um, my questions, I'm gonna play a clip of Dr. Tony Fauci speaking about this as part of the Nine Lessons series. So let's give that a listen. If you have a static situation, with nothing changing, and you get one opinion one day, and then a week later you change it, that's flip-flopping. When you have a dynamic situation that's evolving week to week and month to month, as a scientist, to be true to yourself and to be true to the discipline of science, you have to collect data as the situation evolves, which almost invariably will necessitate you're changing policy, changing guidelines, changing opinion. And that's exactly what happened with things like mask wearing. We didn't know until, you know, weeks and weeks into the outbreak that a lot of the transmission was by people who were without symptoms. And it was that that made the CDC and all of us say, you know, we really don't need to be wearing masks. As soon as we found out that A, there was no shortage, B, we were getting good data that outside of the hospital setting, masks did work. And three, we found out that 50% of the infections were transmitted from someone who had no symptoms. When you put all those three things together, then the science tells us everybody should be wearing a mask. Bill, how did this play out in the smallpox eradication program, specifically this idea of scientific certainty, uncertainty, and science communication? This is actually a balance that goes far beyond public health and medicine and almost everything we do. And on the one hand, you have to have enough certainty 
in order to get other people to follow you. There's a book by Gary Wills on leadership, and it's entitled Certain Trumpets. And he takes this from the Bible verse that says, if you hear an uncertain trumpet, who would gird for battle? So you have to have enough uh, certainty. The other side of that, though, is Richard Feynman, the physicist, who said certainty is the Achilles heel of science. If we believe something is true, we stop looking for other answers to why this is happening. And I think in smallpox, we always tried to present certainty in what we were doing. And all the time, we worried about what could go wrong. What if we lose political support? I didn't see HIV coming, but boy, if I had, that would have been a big problem to deal with. Pauline, don't you think public health officials should still be confident in expressing, particularly in an emergency, what we know and their recommendations for managing a public health crisis? And how do you balance sort of that confidence and reassurance with the lack of certainty? Yeah, so, you know, I think, uh, and building on some of the things that, that Bill said, you know, I think part of it is building the confidence in the communicator. And I think, you know, one of the things, um, you know, and I point to Tony Fauci as one of those people who, you know, I think um, Americans developed a sense of confidence with him because of his willingness and ability to say, um, you know, when we were wrong and what we know and when we knew it. And so I think, you know, recognizing that a lot of this is about building trust and building trust in the message as well as in the messenger, you know, I think that's where some of the ability to be confident, you know, letting people know that you're trying to give them the information as soon as you have it, but also being honest that this is evolving, you know, um, a message is just a slice in time. And I think it's important that we remember that we're creating a narrative every time we open our mouths and, and thinking about what's the narrative that we're creating and being consistent in that narrative. So I think the consistency, um, building that trust, being able to say what you know and what you don't know is what really, I think, builds the confidence in the messages. I think what we saw through this pandemic as well, the COVID pandemic as well as past, are people who are um, unwilling to, ad to admit the, what they know and what they don't know, unwilling to go back and explain why we said something when we said it and why we're uh, making that explanation of why we're now changing as I think Tony Fauci did very clearly about mask wearing. So I think all of those things that really are about building trust and confidence are what can make us better in our communication as public health officials. So it still amazes me that the global health community decided to take on smallpox eradication. Um, we often hear about sustainability, cost effectiveness, those kinds of um, economic concepts. What does it mean, Helene, for a program to be sustainable? And when we say sustainable, for whom? Yeah, well, you know, I think what, what, we, what we hope when we talk about sustainability is that efforts that are important for the short run can be sustained over the long run. And I think what we see so often in public health is that we uh, have this massive um, surge of resources, personnel, uh, effort that then we let go of um, in between times. So each time we have a pandemic, we have to create this big surge all over again. You know, what we need in public health um, is to be able to have that kind of long term sustainable approach, understanding that there will be times when we have to have those surges, but not letting everything go in between time. You know, when you say for whom, uh, you know, it's really about how do we create a system and have a system that is in place that gets us not uh, only at the times of great need and crisis, but there, but is there for the public's health uh, for the long term. And that's what I hope we can move to as we think about public health in America and around the world. Bill, um, 
does that sound like that's a sustainable goal, quote unquote, and should we be setting our public health goals based on what some think is sustainable or not? Well, sustainability is a problem that I often had because people require evidence of sustainability before they'll fund something. But you don't know what is sustainable until you try and, and do it. And one of the lessons that I learned in the 70s was in this country, the appropriations for measles would go up when there were lots of measles cases, and they would go down when cases were reduced. And inevitably, when they would go down, then the numbers had come up again. And so we had these variations. And we made a decision in the 1970s, what would happen if we could interrupt transmission once? And that changes everything. Now the norm would be no transmission and you could sustain the appropriations and it worked. We finally did that. So sustainability is something that bothers me. The, the pragmatists demand this, and I understand where they're coming from, but there was a fellow by the name of Harlan Cleveland, who was an American uh, diplomat. He was our ambassador to NATO for many years. And late in his life, he became interested in global health. And he was astonished at what happened with so few resources. And he came to the conclusion that global health workers are fueled on unwarranted optimism. <laughs> and I like that phrase because that is in fact, what we do is we become very optimistic and we make something happen that could not have been foreseen that it would happen. So this also reminds me about a conversation we had on uh, the podcast with a, believe it or not, a science fiction writer. Uh, her name is Adrienne Marie Brown, and we spoke with her about how she imagines worlds, possibilities different from our own. Uh, so let's hear a short clip of that now. Where do you find the inspiration to think up, to dream up the worlds that are so wildly different from our present reality? Saying that stuff is just the way it is, that's one of the greatest ways that those who currently benefit from the way things are keep us from even imagining that things could be different. For centuries in this country, we were told that slavery was just the way things are and that it could never be any different. And yet there are people in those systems who said, this isn't right this isn't fair, something else is actually possible. So a lot of the work of radical imagination for me is the work of saying, can we imagine a world in which our lives actually matter and we structure our society around the care that we can give to each other, the care that we need. Bill, you just talked about um, unwarranted optimism and you told me once, in fact, I think more than once to bet on the optimists. But to go back to what you're saying about the pragmatist, doesn't it make more sense on some level to be pragmatic and realistic if you want to get things done? And how would realism have gotten in the way of efforts to eradicate smallpox? Well, I think realism would have kept us from trying many things that we tried. And what the clip you just showed about an imagination that goes beyond realism is so important. If I would be director of CDC again, if I had a problem, I would try to get six comedians to come to CDC <laughs> and I'd present them with the problem because they think in a different world than realism. And so I think it's it's just makes sense to be unrealistic that we can do these things. Helene, what about you? How did you balance um, thinking big versus being pragmatic when you were leading public health programs over the course of your career? Well, I didn't bring in comedians, but not, but I think maybe, <laughs> maybe I missed the boat on that. I love that idea. Um, you know, I think uh, if we, I kind of like to think that I was able to combine the two. You know, I think if you don't think big, you will only achieve small progress. So I think you have to have big goals. But big goals can also be chunked into bite sized pieces. So, you know, I think mixing the practical of what are the short term gains that are necessary 
to get to those big goals both give you a sense of the pra what's pragmatic and possible, but also keeps you inspired towards that biggest, the bigger goal. You know, I think it's also the case in public health where oftentimes we are um, operating with um, very difficult political situations. And, you know, again, sometimes you have to be the realist and understand what the limits are, but at the same time, not give up on what's your ultimate goal, what's your ultimate vision, and keeping that uh, front and center. It's incredibly important, uh, particularly as we think about how we inspire, uh, back to the unwarranted optimism, you know, how we inspire public health workers to keep going. People don't get inspired by, you know, the short term, did I get my stock in today? They get inspired by, I'm part of eradicating a disease or stopping a pandemic. So, I, you know, I think we have to be, to combine the two. And so this also, I, might oh, say, I might say that in India, we would have a meeting every month in the endemic states and go over what we had learned that month. And we would end the meeting by setting goals for the next month. We never once reached those goals until the last month. They were always beyond what we could do, but they gave us a vision of what we hoped we could do. So this also reminds me of another aspect of, of goal setting. Um, in another episode of the podcast, we spoke with a global health expert, Dr. Madhu Pai at McGill University. And he pointed out that historically it's been white men in Europe and in the United States who've really driven the agenda in global health. Here's just a short clip from Madhu. We need to kind of flip the switch and recenter global health away from this, what I call default settings in global health, to the front lines, right? People on the ground, people who are Black, Indigenous, people who are in communities, people who are actually dealing with the disease burden, people who are dying of it, right? People who have actually lived experience of these diseases that we're talking about, right? Having them run it is the most radical way of reimagining and shifting power in global health. Bill, who set the smallpox eradication goals? Was this local or global experts or both? Was it local communities? And how are those different perspectives weighed and balanced in the program? Well, the global goal was set by WHO. It was originally conceived by the Soviet Union and presented to WHO, and it got only three votes the first time. Later, when the Soviet Union and the United States combined their efforts, they were able to convince the World Health Assembly and WHO took this on. So the global goal was set by WHO, but countries had the ability to say no. And Ethiopia went for a long time not becoming part of the program. They had other priorities. And these are legitimate priorities. The World Bank once had a uh, a, a discussion on whether we should get into polio eradication or not. And I agreed to be part of the debate, even though I hate debates. I agreed to be part because I wanted to know what were the strongest arguments against polio eradication. And for me, there were two of them. One was that this would distract from other global health efforts. People would focus on this. But the other one came from an African leader who said, this is neocolonialism. You're <clears throat> telling us how to spend our money <clears throat> on a disease problem and not allowing us to make that decision. My counter to that was I understand that, but I also understand when Gandhi said his idea of the golden rule was that he should not be able to enjoy what other people could not enjoy. And so I said, if I can enjoy the fact that my children, my grandchildren, and now my great-grandchildren are free of polio, I have an obligation as a parent to share that with everyone. Helene, um, very often it's um, scientific experts, physicians, epidemiologists who really lead the goal setting. Is there anything wrong with this um, technocratic kind of approach to public health goal setting? And isn't that just, quote, following the science? 
Well, it is obviously following the science at a macro level, but I think, you know, um, while it's important to set these global goals and these, you know, big overarching goals, you know, it's also very important to listen to the people who, you know, whose health we're, we're, we're actually trying to have an impact on. And I can remember um, during the HIV pandemic where once people realized how important it was to mobilize resources, there was an unprecedented amount of resources available for HIV. And, you know, we got from several countries, uh, you know, around the world, uh, the pushback, just as, as Bill was talking about, because they said, you know, malaria is a bigger problem for me. Um, we have more people who die from, from malaria, from measles, from other uh, infectious diseases. So where, is our, where are our resources for the things that are making the biggest difference for our people? So I think it's great to set the global goals and to be able to have these big overarching goals, but we can't do that in the absence of also listening to the national and local needs and making sure that we're thinking flexibly about how we use our resources so that what we do really meets the greatest needs of people on the ground. Bill, you, you once quoted Einstein to me who said, perfection of means and confusion of goals seem in my opinion to characterize our age. So are government officials and public health leaders somehow confused about public health goals while being overly focused on perfecting public health tools? I think so. You can't stop scientists from trying to enlarge their area of knowledge. I mean, this is what scientists do. They try to figure out what is right and what is wrong. And so, yes, we do confuse this. It doesn't matter whether you're talking about a person, a state, a nation, or the world, we devalue health until the day we lose it. And then suddenly it becomes so important. And so this idea of conveying what should happen ahead of time so we don't lose health is, a, is problematic. But yes, it's much easier to, to concentrate on the specifics and lose our sight of where we're actually going with this. Can you just give an example of um, this attempt to perfect a public health tool? Well, the, um, with vaccines, you see that people keep improving the vaccines, but don't improve how to get them to everyone. The clip you showed on white, people, mainly white men, making the decisions on global health in the past is so true. And I've just finished reviewing the history of global health. And I think the one thing that was most destructive of global health was colonialism. Some people try to, to justify it on the basis of it brought new science and so forth. But just think of this country and the fact that colonialism killed off so many people that the slave trade became so important. And so today we're still operating with the effects of colonialism in this hemisphere. So not seeing the vision of the big goal and concentrating on small things, it's easier for all of us to do. Helene, do you agree that public health officials are confused about the goals and, and if so, why and how? Well, you know, I think it's hard to talk about public health officials as a monolith. And, you know, it's, it's part of the challenge, you know, particularly in this country, is that we have such a disjointed um, public health system. And I think we would benefit from having a much different um, public health system such that, you know, um, people can individualize you know, their roles, uh, what they want to focus on, et cetera, but at a national level, and I would argue even at a global level, that there is a system that is consistent about what's most important and that and what's most important to deliver on. So, you know, I do think that there's a lot of inconsistency in our system. I think we have a, um, you know, fragmented public health system, and we would really benefit by having something that really had a much 
more of a network that is coordinated than what we have today. So I just got back um, actually from vacation in Morocco and I happened to be staying in the Medina in Marrakesh the night of the earthquake. And it's now been estimated that uh, nearly 3000 people have died um, in that earthquake or from that earthquake to date. I felt it, um, but the building where I was staying sustained hardly any damage. Um, and to date, I haven't heard of any tourists or expats having been reported dead or seriously injured. Now, this was not an infectious disease outbreak, but it is a public health crisis of a kind, and some are more likely to be hurt and die than others. What does this tell us about, uh, Bill, how to build resilience into the system, and how was this done in the context of smallpox? Well, the resilience is a difficult thing because we think locally. Well, wherever you are in the world, you're both local and global. So I keep telling students, Wherever you're working, you're working on global health. And so start thinking that way of how do we incorporate all these people? You see, you're absolutely right. It doesn't take an infectious disease. It takes a disaster to show what uh, the uh, social problems are that are causing, uh, causing this. Uh, Michael Osterholm once said, one of the best fire departments we have is at the Minneapolis airport. He said, if we go 10 years or 15 years without a crash, no one will reduce their budget. This is the kind of resilience that we need in public health. The last appropriations hearing that I had as director of CDC was chaired by Senator Hatfield from Oregon. He was the chair of the entire appropriations committee but he asked permission to, as a favor to me, to actually chair this last one. He asked me a question that I was not expecting, which is the one you just asked. He asked, if you were in charge, how would you improve the sustainability of public health? And I told him that there were three things I would do. Number one, I would identify any program that has a positive benefit cost ratio. That is for a dollar invested, you save more than a dollar plus you improve health. Because if you don't do that, you're agreeing to spend money and have the disease both. And I said, if you took these programs, and I said, in order to avoid infighting between the Congress and the executive branch, I put this totally in charge of Congress. You decide when a program has a positive benefit cost ratio, and now it doesn't compete with other things in the budget. It, it becomes something that's an entitlement. We need this because it, it's cheaper and it improves health. Number two, I said I would index public health to healthcare expenditures because the ratio of public health to, to healthcare keeps going down every year. I said I would accept whatever it is right now and say we have to index our public health spending to that. And the third, I would come up with mechanisms to improve and reward programs that benefit outcomes. Today, we benefit access and process, but not outcomes. And so if we could benefit outcomes, it would change the way the uh, insurance companies work and other programs work. So those three things I think would provide sustainability and public health we don't have now. Mm -hmm. Helene, how was um, resilience built into the system in the context of HIV and or TB? Um, I'll, I'll answer that in a minute, but I, I just want to add on, you know, and kind of taking from the example that you gave from Morocco, that I think, you know, in, in many cases, we're talking about sustainability and resilience, but we're also talking about equity. Um, you know, at the end of the day, you know, the reason you probably were less likely to get impacted was you were probably staying in a building um, where the construction had been done in a way that it was uh, sustainable and, um, you know, not uh, prone to the conditions of earthquake and the people who are likely to have lost their lives were probably living it in substandard 
um, building situations. So I think every time we think about sustainability and, and, and resist, uh, resilience, we also have to think about equity and are we making sure that the way in which we design our programs take equity into consideration because that's ultimately what is going to make populations and people um, have the kind of resilience that's necessary. You know, I think when I look at um, the programs like tuberculosis and, and HIV, you know, I think what we tried to really do was to build on, um, to, to build up systems as we went along, because the, the best way to make sure that our efforts were sustainable and had resilience built into them was to actually build systems, not just um, focus on the program or the effort that we were doing. So in HIV, clearly, when I look back on the um, public health infrastructure that was built, uh, the, the human capacity that was developed as a result of HIV, that's what starts building in resilience because you're not just building for the HIV pandemic, but you're really using those dollars in ways that can help to strengthen systems. And that's when I think we have the kind of resilience and sustainability that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So lately I've been thinking a lot about this concept of quote, wicked problems. And for people who are not familiar with this term, uh, goes back to the management literature uh, a few, several decades ago. And these are complicated, they're messy, they're context specific problems. People may not agree that there is a problem or what the problem is. They disagree on what caused it. And with wicked problems, there's no one right solution, just some that might be less bad, might often create new problems. Um, and so these are very much about values and not just science. Bill, how would you apply this idea of wicked problems to public health challenges like smallpox or COVID? Well, wicked problems turns out to be a good expression of a, a great picture of this. And when I think of vaccines, for instance, and the beginning in 1796 of the smallpox vaccine and how they've improved in numbers and types. When I was born, my baby book shows I got only two vaccinations. Children today will get 18 or 19 or 20 different uh, vaccinations. And you look at the future of this, we now have two vaccines against cancer, one against liver cancer, and one against uh, cervical cancer. We're gonna see more uh, vaccines against uh, neoplasms. You look at the possibility of having vaccines in the future for certain heart diseases, or even for addiction, alcoholism and drug addiction. And the possibilities are so great and yet at the same time, we have more and more people who don't trust science, don't trust government, and they become anti-vaxxers. So this is the real challenge of vaccines. It will continue to be the foundation of global health, but we have to figure out how to get people incorporated in the solutions. Vashon Island in Puget Sound had a reputation for very low immunization uptake. And many of the people on the island were the hippies of the 60s, and they didn't trust government and so forth. The New York Times actually had a front page article on the rate of uh, immunization in children. And I think about 19% were not being immunized. Now, they would not listen to the health officers of Seattle or anyone else of authority coming in. But two parents who had been Peace Corps volunteers started their own program of finding out from people, what would it take for you to change your mind? What is it that you don't know that you wish you knew? And the uh, vaccination rate decreased from 81% or increased from 81% up to 88, 89%. They were doing something at a grassroots level that we could not have done from the top down. And uh, so there are solutions to wicked problems, but they sure do require energy and organization and the ability to respect culture. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
Colleen, is there a way we can better align people who have different sets of values around some of the same public health goals or strategies um, when it comes to some of these wicked problems, whether that is COVID or some of the other um, problems facing us today, whether it may be climate change or disinformation, Bill mentioned um, some of the challenges with anti-vaxxers and anti-science. Uh, well, this is another time where I think we should bring in the comedians. <laughs> um, you know, I, uh, but but I do think it, maybe not the comedians, but to to kind of take a point from what you were saying earlier, Bill. You know, I do think looking at how do you find the common ground, and sometimes you know um, there's only five percent of common ground, but you can start with that, and you know continue to grow from there. So you know, I think oftentimes we approach these things um, that are adversarial in a, in a counter adversarial way. So, you know, if somebody's hostile, we up the hostility instead of thinking, all right, where, where can we find common ground? What are the things that we all agree upon? And sometimes it's just the simple fact that we agree that, you know, uh, saving lives is a high value and you can start from there and begin to develop the proof points that make non-believers believers. So, you know, I just think, it, I think we don't do enough of thinking about where we find common ground and instead um, go to our corners and think by continuing to insist on what we believe and think that that's what's going to convince people versus starting from where we all have a common belief and building from there. You know, I don't know any other way to do it. It's not a magic bullet. It won't work any, all the time. But I also think there has to be a point at which you recognize there are some people who you will never get on your side. And if you continue to try to wait for that to happen, um, you know, you'll get stuck and not move forward. So there's always a certain point when you just need to keep moving forward, understanding that if you demonstrate effectiveness, um, you will, that may be the most likely way of bringing others along. And when, when I've had an opportunity to meet with anti-vaxxers, I always start with the fact that I know no parent does this withholding vaccines to hurt their child. Exactly. They do it only because they believe it's the best thing for their child. And so if you can start there, you're in a different position than if you just say, well, don't you read the literature? Or don't you listen to, to So I think uh, understanding that there's a reason why people feel this way is the beginning. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, earlier we were talking a bit about um, public health tools and this desire to perfect public health tools, but at the same time, um, innovations in medical technology were in fact key to eradicating smallpox, especially a simple little tool called the bifurcated needle. Here's a clip um, of some smallpox eradication workers discussing this tool from episode four of the podcast. In the early 1970s, smallpox was still stalking parts of South Asia. India had launched its eradication program more than a decade before, but public health workers couldn't keep up with the virus. Enter the bifurcated needle. It was a marvelous invention in its simplicity. It looks like a little cocktail fork. You dip the prongs into a bit of vaccine. And you would just prick the skin about 12 or 15 times and until there was a, a little trace of blood and then you'd take another one. It barely took 30 seconds to vaccinate someone. And it didn't hurt. No. Well, it didn't hurt too much. It was just like a pinprick rapidly done on your forearm. You had a huge supply with you and you just went about and dug, 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 vaccinated people. Carry hundreds with you at one go. And you can train somebody in a matter of minutes to do it. Easy to use, easy to clean, and a big improvement over the twisting teeth of the vaccine instrument health workers had to use before. The bifurcated needle was maybe two and a half, three inches long, small but sturdy enough for rough and tumble field work. It was made of steel and 
it used to come in something that looked like a brick. It was just like one of those gold bricks that you see in the movies. And maybe worth its weight in gold. So Bill, um, public health officials say in the context of COVID that we now have the tools to diagnose and treat and prevent COVID. But are these tools enough for us to declare victory over COVID when not everyone has access to those tools? And in the context of smallpox, how did non-biomedical tools complement uh, biomedical in, uh, innovations like the bifurcated needle? Well, uh, going back to what Helene said, we have to be thinking of this globally and everyone and realize that these tools for smallpox, that is the vaccine, at least some way of giving it, existed long before WHO decided to have a program. But the people that were getting smallpox were the ones who were disenfranchised. They were the ones who were unemployed in poverty, who had bias, that sort of thing. And so uh, it was very important to include the non-technical things and in smallpox, I can tell you that every school and every church and every chief of a village and every volunteer that became involved was part of the solution of this. Now, on the other hand, I can't quite give up on smallpox eradication even now, uh, 40 plus years later. And I keep thinking of ways we could have improved. I, nowadays, I would train dogs to pick up the scent of smallpox. It, it, because uh, sometimes you would have beggar communities, people actually at the railroad station covered with a cloth with smallpox, but nobody knew that. But a dog would have picked that up right away. I've even come to the conclusion, if we were well enough organized, we could get rid of smallpox without vaccine and without the biotechnical tools, the, the bifurcated needle, the jet injector, and so forth. You would simply get people who are sick with smallpox and you would isolate them immediately and then you would follow all of their contacts and the first symptom in a contact would get isolated and so on and it would if you were organized well enough you could get rid of smallpox without vaccine so the tools are very important but they're not the last word well, and in fact, that's uh, the approach that was used for Ebola. And now we have a vaccine, but um, most of the Ebola control efforts uh, during the West African epidemic were really about that, identifying and isolating. Uh, Helene, are we overly reliant on biomedical tools? And um, should we, uh, if, if we are overly reliant, should we, uh, pave the way for greater use of non-biomedical tools? Well, you know, as we know, uh, the social determinants of health contribute more to health status than um, access to health care itself. So access to health care, including all the biomedical advances, is necessary but not sufficient. I think we have to continue to think about, you know, why do we have some of the uh, gaps in health that we know already exist. You know, we look at the COVID pandemic as an example, you know, where we know that the populations that were at greatest risk outside of age um, are people who lived in, in houses that were overcrowded or who had jobs that put them at risk, low wage earners, et cetera. So, you know, I think we, we have to think about both things. And I think, you know, uh, back to your earlier question that is kind of about, you know, people's trust and mistrust, part of the trust in people being willing to access some of our biomedical tools comes from feeling that the rest of their needs are also being taken care of. So if we just think of populations as, you know, we've got these great tools and, and you know, we are going to um, give you these tools, uh, you know, where when your greatest uh, challenge is whether or not you're going to be able to feed your children at night or whether or not you're going to have a roof over your head, um, you're not going to be as eager to, and the uptake of our biomedical tools will not be as great. So I, I just think it's about combining both and making sure that we're thinking about some of these root causes 
that will also be part of um, helping to enhance, de, focusing on those will also be part of enhancing people's trust and belief in some of the other approaches, the biomedical approaches that we know also make a huge difference. Um, public health is, is different from clinical medicine in that it focuses on the public or the we, so to speak, while clinical medicine focuses on the I or, or the patient. There seems to be very little appetite in this moment for thinking about the we. Bill, is there anything wrong with that? And if so, how do we shift that perspective, that thinking about we in public health and beyond? People often say clinical medicine deals with the numerator, the people that come to clinics and hospitals for care, while public health deals with the denominator. That's simplistic because the denominator includes the numerator. And so public health really is concentrated on everybody on the we and the how to get everybody together on this. There are two things from history that always impressed me. Confucius was asked by a student once, could you tell us in one word how best to live? And Confucius said, is not reciprocity that word? And so this is we, that everybody's uh, dealing with each other. And then Gandhi said his idea of the golden rule was that he should not enjoy something not enjoyed by everyone, the we. So we keep hearing this from the wise people of history to stop thinking about just ourselves. Gandhi also said we should seek interdependence with the same zeal that we seek self-reliance. And then he added in a soft voice, there is no alternative. And, and this is true, there is no alternative. And we've just got to take that approach in school that much of school is built around how to improve your self-reliance, how to develop, how to get money in the future and so forth. And we have to figure out how to teach interdependence. Helene, should we be moving from an I to a we framing? And, and if so, how do we do that? Yeah, I think we have to. Uh, I think we we recognize, you know, and, and when we have pandemics, it's very obvious. You know, you can't just think about what's happening to you as an individual without recognizing that if we don't uh, stem transmission for something like a COVID, all of our all of us are at risk. So I think this sense of reciprocity um, is critical as we think about it. And it, you know, it's it's more broadly in our society. You know, we can't think that uh, crime happens in one part of the city and it won't also impact our economy, the economy of the city overall, and ultimately impact other neighborhoods. I, you know, I think we continue to think that we can wall off problems when we uh, have to realize how interconnected we are, whether it's health, whether it's our economies, you know, whether it's the issue of, of climate change, you know, I think as a, as a species, you know, we're at a point where the I thinking um, is having huge impacts for all of us. And unless we start having that we mindset, you know, we, you know, we really are not going to be able to tackle some of these, you know, difficult, wicked problems. And oh, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry. If I could add one thing that Will Durant once said, we will never do things globally unless we fear an alien invasion. And the what we've come up with are surrogates for alien invasions. So we see nuclear weapons as threatening them, all of us, so we think we. But there are other things. Uh, by our synthetic biology might be another one of these. Uh, climate change may be a, a, th a third one. We have four or five things that could totally eliminate people. And we should be thinking we in order to solve those problems. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I'm now going to shift gears a little bit and take some of the questions our audience has been sending in. The first comes from Parvi Bhatt, uh, who asks, as we try to deal with new pandemics and eliminate older ones, how can we balance attention spans, science, and safety in a world where, quote, failing fast 
and disruption define how we think about innovation? Helene, do you want to take a stab at that one? Well, you know, I just think we have to stay the course and continue to find ways. And, you know, we started out talking about health communications. You know, I think um, we need to get better at our communications and in keeping people engaged in issues because we are living in this, you know, 24 7 news cycle and, uh, you know, a new issue coming up all the time. I think we as health professionals have an obligation to make sure that we are keeping these issues that are uh, that are front and center, um, you know, in people's minds and continue to, to um, share what progress is happening. Because I think when people recognize there's progress um, and you're not just telling the same old story, I think you can keep people engaged. But I think it's on us to do a better job in that, uh, you know, in that, in that regard. Bill? I tell students now, and it took me a long time to reach this conclusion, that whenever they're faced with these big problems, to think of three things. Number one, try to get the science right. We, we've talked about you can't always do that and you have to apologize and go back, but try to get the science right. Number two, add art to the science. Uh, Will Durant says the first scientist that we know by name was Imhotep in Egypt, who was a physician and an artist and designed the Step Pyramid. Because he said, then you get creative common sense at its best. It was Huxley that said science is simply common sense at its best. So you get creative common sense at its best. And then I go back 700 years to Roger Bacon, who did a report for the Pope. And he said, one of the problems with science is it has no moral compass. And so you have to develop scientists with a moral compass. And when you do this, now you have moral, creative, common sense at its best. And this is a great approach to wicked problems. Is, is public health science with a moral compass? It's supposed to be. And so, sometimes we see it drifting off, but in general, uh, public health people have a social mind that they're trying to do this with a moral compass, including everyone. Our next question comes from uh, Marina Pradhan. Can you touch upon how the message needs to be as simple and brief as possible? Dr. Fauci's message was very on point from a public health point of view, but how many in the general population would be able to assimilate that? Uh, Helene. Yeah, I would just say, you know, we have to tailor the message to the audience. You know, when I saw the background uh, that, that Dr. Fauci was talking uh, against, I think he was talking to an audience of people who could incorporate that message. I might be wrong, but I, but I think regardless, the point is, you know, if you're sitting and talking to a group of public health professionals, you have one message. If you're talking to the general public, you have another. And I think it is true that we sometimes get um, kind of confused with our own language because there's so many nuances to public health that we put out these messages that by the time we're done, you know, it's hard to know, do you believe yes or do you believe no? So I agree, I think we have to keep it simple, but I think we also have to keep it truthful. And sometimes that's a real challenge with the nuances of public health messaging, but I think, again tailoring it to the different audiences and recognizing that you know you may that, that hopefully you have more than one bite at the apple if you will to make it short and concise but then have other opportunities where you can explain it in uh, greater detail mm -hmm, mm -hmm. bill uh this question is for you uh from mark rosenberg <laughs> one of the new epidemics in the public health crisis of gun violence or what, sorry, one of the new public, one of the new epidemics is the public health crisis of gun violence, now the leading cause of death for children and teens in the United States. Are there lessons from the eradication of smallpox that could be applied to help solve this new epidemic? Well, I think all of the, the lessons from smallpox, knowing the truth, having coalitions, making sure that you're progressing in the right way, having respect for culture, all of these things uh, do apply, but I would end that answer 
with becoming better ancestors, we're saying that the ultimate expression of love from any of us is to become a better ancestor. And we certainly can do better on gun violence and don't put up with this, the discussion that says this is due to mental health problems and this and that when other countries don't have the same problem uh, and they have just as much mental health problems as we, as we do, but they don't have the guns available. Helene, uh, this is a question from Ayo Femi Asanubi. Uh, Bill mentions that we don't know what is sustainable till we try. How would you approach sustainability for pandemic preparedness in the midst of trying to prioritize basic health service delivery? Uh, you know, well, I think that the two aren't necessarily in opposition. I think, you know, we need to have basic health services and building on basic services, um, making sure that we're thinking about how are those services available and sustainable so that when we have crises, public health crises, those systems are there and functional in a way that allows us to ramp up for public health emergencies. So I think those things are not in opposition. You know, it's what I was talking about earlier. I think we need um, a more um, uh, clear and comprehensive public health system that doesn't just get ramped up every time we have a crisis, that it's there, that it's, that it's stable, that we have the kind of workforce that we need, that we have the kind of tools that we need, and that those are in place, and that we build upon those, then the other services that are important, um, you know, for, for individual care. So I, you know, again, I kind of go back to a lot of this is about how we build systems that can be sustained and that are flexible uh, and nimble so that they can respond when we have these public health crises. So um, one last question, I'm gonna um, give this one to Bill uh, from David Torres. I teach my global health students about the history of smallpox eradication. Given the coercive nature of the final push to vaccinate some people for smallpox and today's resistance to and mistrust of public health measures, including vaccination campaigns and masking for COVID, uh, would the elimination of smallpox be conceivable today? And if so, how would it be accomplished? It would be very difficult today because of HIV and not knowing about immune systems, but you could still do it. And the uh, question about coercion, we hear this often, and most of this comes from one paper by uh, Dr. Greenow, where he has interviewed people who worked on smallpox who used coercion. They would break into huts at two in the morning with the police officer to do that. It, that none of that was necessary. And so particular people were so enthusiastic about smallpox eradication that they did this, but, Think about it for a moment. If you have a village with three people who have refused vaccination, if they get uh, smallpox, they, everyone around them is already vaccinated. They're the ones that suffer. You don't have to go in and use coercion. And so when I've talked to other people who worked in smallpox, they're surprised that anyone used coercion. You don't have to do that. And that's part of respecting the culture is that... Uh, you find other ways to do this. Well, I, I really want to thank both of you, Bill and Helene, uh, for joining us today and for answering all of my questions, the audience's questions. Um, between the two of you, you have over a century's worth of wisdom uh, in public health. Uh, also, please check out the podcast, uh, Epidemic. It's available on uh, Apple, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, season two is the season on uh, eradication of smallpox. And also check out The Nine Lessons at ninelessons.org. And uh, thanks everyone for joining us today. <laughs>